Go ahead, run that. You see this movie? Two thousand three, Walt Disney. Dig those holes. Man, I'm sorry. With broken hands and withered souls, emancipated from all you know. You got to go and dig those holes. So, what if I told you that what you really needed this morning was a shovel? That you needed to go start digging because in order to step into the next season of your life, it's going to require for you to dig some holes. Well, you'd think I was as crazy as Elisha. It's amazing how a prophetic voice will always sound strange in its generation. And we are called in the same way as Elisha to be a prophetic voice to our generation. I was having dinner last night with someone who astutely said, if there is no Jesus, my life should look absolutely absurd because the way that I live completely depends on him. So what, I, what would it look like for you to dig some holes in your life? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. If you find yourself in a rut this morning, something that has been created because of repetitive issues, you need to dig a deeper hole to get out of your rut. And that's what we're going to look at this morning as we look at Elisha once again. It doesn't sound like it makes sense. But we're going to see that God wants us to prepare for him to come through. He wants us to actually be thankful before the answer to our prayer actually shows up. Making our petitions to God with thanksgiving. That's what Philippians talks about. So this series uh, about the life of Elisha, the prophet, is uh, where we are now. Uh, it's the second week of this series. Now last week, um, Willow Smalljohn did a great job painting a painting for us. And it should be on the screen, maybe behind us. Advance that slide. Yeah, good job. Um, this is a, a picture that was painted about the passage we talked about last week. We saw that for complete surrender to happen, Elisha had to burn his plows. He had to eliminate the option of retreating. And if you didn't hear the message, we encourage you to, to watch the video cast on the website or the podcast. And you can listen as you're working out or walking or cleaning the house or whatnot. So Elijah, the prophet, calls Elisha as his successor. And as his successor, then he embraces it by burning the plow. He throws a barbecue and uh, he surrenders to the call of God. Stephen Furtick says this, The way that I see it, there are two major reasons why well-intentioned people like us get stuck after we burn our plows. One, we don't think big enough. And two, we don't start small enough. In other words, we need to dream Big dreams with God about our future and not worry about being overly ambitious. Oftentimes, faith is labeled as presumption. But God wants us to dream big because he's got big things for us to step into. Catherine Elizabeth Hudson, daughter of Pentecostal pastors, in Santa Barbara, California, grew up in Christian schools and sang in the church until she was 17, took lessons on guitar and singing. And after getting her GED early, she ventured into pop music where she had some early success known as Katie Hudson. And it was during this time that uh, a friend of mine actually was sitting next to her. She was a nobody. Nobody knew sh who she was. And she turned to him and said, I'm going to do everything I can to be a star. Well, it wasn't very long after that that she started going by the name Katy Perry. And she is known to the pop music world. And while I'm not saying go out and buy her music, there was a dream in her heart that she went after. She was dreaming big. D.L. Moody said this, If God is your partner, make your plans big. So at the same time, we're dreaming big. We need to also start small. We need to have, 
realistic steps of obedience. Because God calls us to obedience and that he blesses it. So he calls us to some realistic steps that actually make God's vision for our life actually come to pass so we can walk it out. So years ago, around the time Katy Perry was born, a young high school student here in Chico began taking lessons and working on singing and trying to be good at music. And like many kids, he dreamed of playing music on big stages and he realized he had to start somewhere. And this meant he led worship for kids camps at Neighborhood Church. And he was willing to drive to cities around Chico just enough, just for, with enough gas money to get there. He wanted to start somewhere. He recorded a cassette tape. That's uh, an early version of the CD for those of you who don't know. And this kid with a big dream to do music now has recorded four CDs. But he's never going to be a rock star and he's not planning on it. Because he just always wanted to make a difference. And believes that music is something that makes you sensitive to God. And so, that kid is me. And with a vision to make a difference, I said to myself, why is, are my little kids listening to someone else's music to go to sleep? This doesn't make any sense. you got to start somewhere. And I started asking people, how do I do this? And I said, well, I don't know. We haven't done it either, but this is kind of what you do. And so I began just asking questions about how I might record my music, that it just, I might be able to play the piano so when my kids go to sleep, they would get to go to sleep to my music, to the music that is on my heart that might be peaceful. And so against all odds and spending more money than I ever made, I released this first CD in 2003, which is what you need to put your kid to sleep with at night. I, I like the fact that he dressed like me today. That was pretty cool. He also wanted to get on the stage as well, so that was pretty cool. The point is this. That there's a lot of people that talk about recording their music, but they never take the risk. It's okay that I'm never going to be a rock star. Actually, I like it that way. So there's got to be some realistic steps. All those hours and hours of of torturing my poor parents, playing the same songs over and over and over so that I could get better. What was that? That was starting small. That was believing that God had something for me. And the most powerful thing was, in the last few years, I've gotten messages from people that listen to my last CD, which has the words that Jesus sings over you. And when I got the message from actually several times, they said, you know what? I was contemplating suicide, and I listened to your CD, and I decided to get help. And I thought, man, it's all worth it. Every single dime I invested, every single hour I spent trying to figure out my scales and all that, I started small, and the payoff is infinitely worth it. So we've got to think big. The active ingredient for God's greater work, though, is for us to start small. So burning the plows... Last week, talked about, you're going to need to blow a torch for that, or at least a set of matches. And this week, you need a shovel. That's the tool that we need to dig some ditches. Now, um, there's an art, a new art piece uh, for this week. In fact, go ahead and put it on the screen. Um, that's not a great picture. I'm sorry, Addison. Addison McNabb um, did our art this week, and um, it is a picture of this passage. I gave her probably the hardest passage of the whole series. That, that we would dig ditches in a valley trusting that God was going to come through. That he's going to provide the water that we need, the refreshing that we need. So this, this shows the driest of valleys, the ruts in our life, and God's heart to pour out the living water into our life. The life to the fullest that we live by faith. And digging ditches, expecting the rain of his provision. So if you want to turn with me to um, 2 Kings 3, that's where we are this morning. And um, yeah, we'll talk about the people first. Good idea. Um, in the beginning of 2 Kings 3, it says, uh, Joram, son of Ahab, by the way, he's the bad guy, bad king, became the king of Israel in Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat. He's the king of Judah. And he reigned 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. 
here's the deal. The northern kingdom lasts for like 200 years. Well, up to this point, 200 years. And, and like no good king, not one. Like, can we get a good leader, please? So these, I, this guy does evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as his father and mother Jezebel and Ahab had done. He got rid of the sacred stone of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the, to the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and which had caused Israel to com- commit sins, and he did not turn away from them. So here's the deal. Joram is not a good guy, but he's kind of trying to convince everybody that he's got it together. And there's an outward, external, like, I'm trying to do the right thing, so I tore down these statues. Now, next slide shows us um, two false gods. Baal, who is this false god that Elijah goes after on Mar- Mount Carmel. And, um, and Baal has, like, kind of this... Um, uh, bull kind of a look, and it's a, fertil- a fertility god, a thunder in one, one hand, lightning in the other, rider of the clouds, he's a god of rain. By the way, God loves to just show the false gods that they're actually not real by either withholding rain or sending it whenever he wants. And so that's what we're going to see in this story. But Baal is this false god um, who the people of Canaan are worshiping. They're also worshiping Asherah. Now you, you can see Gideon here, he's taken down the Asherah pole, which is kind of like a totem pole. Uh, it's a fertility god. Uh, on the female side, Asherah was um, like the mother of the, of the 70 or so gods that they worshipped in Canaan. Uh, so Baal is actually the son of Asherah. They're just bad false gods at the end of the day. That's all you need to know. Um, but we continue to see God showing that he's God in this generation that Elisha's in and showing that he's indeed more powerful than any of these false gods. So Joram, he is, um, he's removed a few of these things, but his heart really isn't, isn't with God. Um, and um, so he has a, a somewhat of an external reformation, but it's clear that his heart is not there, and we're going to see that. Jehoshaphat, so next guy, go to the next slide. There we go. Um, he's the king of Judah. Judah is the southern kingdom. It's made up of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Um, and the other 10 tribes are up north. And so um, Judah is where Jerusalem is. Uh, that's the center of worship in, in, in Judah. And Jehoshaphat's a good king. The testimony was that he sought after the Lord with all his heart. May that be said of us. That we would seek the Lord with all our heart. Second Chronicles 22 says, The kingdom of, of Judah was never more pro- prosperous than under his reign. Uh, and he worked really hard to cleanse out all of the idols, the false gods. And he, then he had such a heart for God, he sent out the priests and the Levites all throughout the land to teach the people what the law of God was. This guy's a rock star. I really like him, except I see myself in him. I see that oftentimes with such a heart to reach out to other people and make peace, I will compromise what I hold dear in order to... To make peace. And he does this with King Ahab first. Remember, Ahab's the wicked king. I mean, he and Jezebel are like killing all the godly people. And I mean, they're just, they're worshiping false gods. And they're all kinds of awful. So he he makes an alliance with Ahab. And and that goes horribly wrong. It almost destroys the whole kingdom of Judah. Then he gets into an alliance with Ahaziah. Ahaziah, that's a hard word to say. That's Ahab's son. That also goes totally wrong. They, they get this whole fleet of ships, and the whole fleet of ships gets wrecked. God's blessing is not in compromising and coming alongside um, this really these evil kings. And then Joram is the third king, and, and this is not going well either. And so, I don't know about you, but oftentimes we can cave in and decide to partner with others who don't have the same values, especially kingdom values. And then we scratch our head and we wonder why things go sideways. Now, I'm not saying that we should um, ha- have our hard hearts toward people that don't have the same values. But if you're going to get into business, if you're going to get into a relationship, if you're going to invest with someone in some way, have kingdom values. If you're a Jesus follower. Second Corinthians 6 talks about not being yoked together with unbelievers you can look at that later so we have jehoshaphat he's he's our good guy the king of edom who is subservient to judah and uh, the king of moab who is the bad guy in the story Uh, he the moabites are the descendants of lot's daughter for those of you who are sunday school graduates who are trying to keep track edom by the way are the people of esau Um, so all these peoples are related 
uh, very closely related. If you go a couple generations back. And then Elisha, the prophet of God who's not so famous yet. The places, what's going on here? We've got Edom. I know this is a little Bible one-on-one here. Next slide. Um, the kingdom of Eden, Edom is uh, down there south of the Dead Sea, and it is crazy desert. Uh, a few of us were in the Middle East a few years ago, and we were in this area, and it is just, we were walking through going, how does anyone live here? It's part of the same area where the, when the Israelites were taking their 40-year camping trip that they went through there as well. And you think, there must be a God that keeps these people alive because this is, there's nothing here. And so what ha- what's going to happen in this story is that the people of I- the Israel are going to connect with the people of Judah. And they're going to go down to the kingdom of Edom. And they're going to be going up to fight Moab when they get stuck in the desert. Now Edom is also the place where Petra is. That's one of the ancient, one, uh, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Um, it is just I long to visit this place. We didn't get to go there when we were in the country of Jordan. So uh, 2 Kings 3, verse 9. Um, next slide. One more. So the king of Israel set out with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And uh, after a roundabout march of seven days, the army had no more water for themselves or for the animals with them. I don't know if this is bad planning or just deciding to march through the desert. Uh, but this is a major problem. This will get you killed. This is not just, oh, I'm going to be thirsty. This is all of our herds, all of our flocks, all of our men are going to die. What? exclaimed the king of Israel. Has the Lord called us three kings together only to hand us over to Moab? Now, when you look at the rest of the passage, we find out that none of these kings heard from the Lord. None of them actually prayed about this. In fact, the king of Israel, who's not even a God follower, decides, this is what we're going to do. I'm kind of ticked off that Moab's not sending their tribute to me, so let's just, let's fight a war. And uh, Jehoshaphat's like, okay, I just want to be at peace. We'll go with you. Our horses will be your horses. Let's go. So away they go, picking up Edom along the way to go up to Moab. And they get stuck, and they don't have any water. How often do we assume that we know what God wants us to do, but we don't even really ask him or seek counsel? We're quick to say yes to things that benefit us and sometimes mislabel them as what God has called me to do, but it would maybe be more accurate to say it's what I really want to do. It's okay to want to do stuff. Just don't implicate the Lord if you're not sure or if you really haven't sought him or if you haven't got wise counsel in your life. It's free. Verse 11. But Jehoshaphat asked, is there no prophet of the Lord here? Let's time out. So as much as we have a succession of kings, we also have a succession of prophets. This is the mouthpiece for God to the king. The Jiminy Cricket, the conscience that says, hey, it's not a good idea. This is against God's law this is against god's will it's against god's character don't do that or do this or this is what god's saying and so um because the holy spirit was only given to kings and prophets and just a few people you you kind of had to have like the guy with the telephone the red phone to god god what do, which we do next and and so the the king of israel says what do we not have a prophet here like have we not put a prophet on our staff that we can m- inquire the lord through him an officer of the king answered Elisha, son of Shaphat, is here. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Like, oh, well, you know, he at least used to hang out with Elijah. He was a rock star prophet. So, like, maybe he can help us. By the way, it was typical procedure to have, uh, in the Near East, to have uh, an army staffed with some religious personnel who would um, can make requests of God for you. So that was, that was normal. So, apparently, El- Elisha is close by because Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the, the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So here's Joram. Um, he's not desperate for God. He's just desperate for a solution. And they go nor, you know, looking for the guy who's normal, is, is the art, artist formerly known as Mr. Plow, right? And so uh, verse 13, Elisha says to the king of Israel, what do, do we have to do with each other? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. By the way, that's the prophets of Baal and Asherah. In other words, 
wait, why all of a sudden are you interested in God helping you because you haven't been serving him? By the way, God's not obligated to do anything for anyone. God's God and we're not. His ways are higher than our ways and higher than our thoughts. Now that bugs us because we're entitled Americans. We're like, no, everybody is entitled. Now God's gracious. It's like the kids who live next door. You don't have to feed them dinner. You don't. You could choose to feed them dinner. They're not your kids, but you could, you could choose to. That would be really nice. Debbie, it would be really nice if you fed the kids next door. But those aren't your kids. You're not responsible for them. And I know the analogy breaks down to a little bit with God, but in the same way, here's Joram. He's serving false gods, and then all of a sudden when he gets in trouble, he runs to God. How often, time, how often do we, like the only time we check in with God is like, God, I'm really in trouble. I'm doing a test right now, and I didn't study. Can you help me? I might lose my job, God. I, I really need your help. And it's okay to come to God in crisis and cry out to him. But it's so interesting that we don't go and seek him when things are going well. That's a, you know what I mean. So, no, the king of Israel answered, because it was the Lord who called us three kings together to hand us over, over to Moab. This is just not true. This guy ticks me off. Elisha says, as surely as the Lord Almighty lives whom I serve, if I did not have respect for the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not even look at you or notice you. You think he's a little edgy? You know who he learned from? Elijah. You think Elisha's edgy? Read about Elijah. He was really edgy. By the way, everything in the Bible, you're not supposed to imitate. You're not supposed to imitate that attitude, by the way. He's, he's all ticked off. Now, bring me a harpist, he says. Musician, a liar player or something like that. And while the harpist was playing, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. So, notice, Elisha wouldn't have even talk to them except for Jehoshaphat being there. And Jehoshaphat was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. And God still recognized him as his own. And sometimes you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people, and God still recognizes you as his own. And really, like these people are dying of thirst, and you, like they, he wants to put a worship CD on? Oftentimes, what we need to do is change the atmosphere around us. And worship is one of those things that changes the atmosphere. It changes our heart. I can imagine, Elisha's like, I'm ticked at you. Your dad, uh, Ahab, tried to kill my master, my mentor, Eli uh, Elisha, Elijah. I can imagine he's, he's ticked off. He's like, man, I need, to calm, I need to calm down. Put the worship CD on. Because worship always brings us to a place of sensitivity to the presence of God. Now, not all of us are worship pathway. That's like our first thing. For some of you, you need to go for a walk. You need to see creation that leads you to a place of worship and wonder. Awesome. Some of you need complete silence. I floated in one of those deprivation tanks this week where it was completely silent. Wow. It's easier to hear God when there's no sound. I know that's probably not a surprise to you. But there's different ways, and worship is helpful. <coughs> and so, it's, it, by the way, it's common for prophets to call for, a, for the background mood music. And then he said, verse 16, this is what the Lord says. Make this valley full of ditches. This is the punchline in the whole passage. Can you believe that? Make this valley full of ditches. For this is what the Lord says says you will neither you will, you will see neither wind nor rain yet this valley will be filled with water and you your cattle and your other animals will drink this is an easy thing in the eyes of the lord and he will also bonus he'll also hand moab over to you you're going to have victory with your military so what's god asking for god's asking for them to stay up all night and dig ditches in the desert expecting god to give water Oh, and by the way, you're not going to get to see the clouds coming. You're going to see that later in 2 Kings. You're not going to hear the wind. You're not going to know that the storm is coming. You just got to trust the Lord. So these three kings come. They want a miracle. They get a work order. Make it happen. Can you imagine 
those guys going back to their, their men, okay, men, here's the deal. Here's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to dig ditches in the desert, a lot of them. How many ditches? Not just one. Make this valley full of ditches. So even though they're on the edge of extinction, God calls them to trust by stepping out. Before they see God's hand moving to deliver them, they've got to step out in faith. And God, God tells us to do the same. Start planning for what I'm going to do to deliver you. Now, I'm not talking about prosperity gospel or saying that, you know, if you do this, then God will make you rich. These people are, like, depending on God to live for water. His grace is sufficient for us. His power is made perfect in our weakness. He supplies every need for us. So this doesn't make any sense in their heads, I'm sure. And only God can send the rain. This is great because it just proves once again that Baal is not the rain sender, it's God. It's not Asherah, the fertility goddess, who gives the rain and, and provides for these people, it's God. And rain is God's specialty. So it took a sacrifice of hard work before they saw evidence that God was coming through for them. I wonder what small steps and practical preparation steps that we need to make and what God is asking us to do. Not just one ditch, but a valley full of ditches. Not just in one area of your life, but in every area of your life, creating space for God to come and deliver you, to save you, to bring you breakthrough, to destroy addiction. We ought to be digging all sorts of ditches in our relationships, in our careers, in our ministries, with our neighbors, our marriage, our home, our time, our finances, our future. Making opportunities for God to move. And this is an immediate obedience issue for them, right? And they, they can't just go, oh, that's a good idea. Someday we're going to dig some ditches. That's a really good idea. No, they've got to do that now. Why? Because they're going to die if they don't. Oftentimes, we don't understand obedience as a, an urgent thing. I, I was <laughs> read this little story um, about uh, these parents that were having a hard time getting their son to clean his room. I know you've never experienced that before, but, you know, there's some people that have a hard time getting their kids to clean their room. Yeah, it's amazing. And the son would always agree, sure, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. But they never, not really follow through. So after high school, the young man joins the Marine Corps. And when he came home for leave, after basic training, his father asked him, what have you learned in the service? Dad, he said, I learned that now means now. Delayed obedience is not obedience at all. Partial obedience is not obedience at all. And oftentimes God has called us to do something. He's called us to do some ditch digging in our life. Maybe address an issue in our life, a problem, an addiction, a, a, a thing that, uh, that he's called us to do that we haven't followed through on. And we're standing around going, where's the rain, God? Where's the rain? And he's like, you didn't dig the ditch yet, dude. God wouldn't call you dude. He'd probably something, call you something different. Call you by your name. Why? Because you didn't obey on the last thing that he told you. Why would he give you another command when he's still waiting for you to dig the ditch right in front of you? And it might be something small. I'm amazed at how many people I talk to who are stuck. And I ask them, what's the last clear thing that God spoke to you? What did he show you that you're supposed to follow through on? And they'll say, well, I don't know. I say, well, let's just take a second and quiet our heart and just ask the Holy Spirit to remind you. By the way, that's really effective. And they'll say, oh, you know what? I, th I really kind of felt like the Lord wanted me to, it could be something simple. The Lord wanted me to start taking piano lessons. The Lord wanted me to reach out to my son who lives out in Montana. God wants me to uh, begin to work on uh, my physical body. God wants, uh, God was really speaking and, and really leading me to build a relationship with this young person so I could pour my life into them. Well, have you done that yet? 
well, no, I kind of got busy, and uh, there's been stuff going on. It's just been a really busy season. In fact, I got sick for a while, and then I was traveling. And my kids have had this stuff going on. Wait a second. Stop with the excuses. Did you dig the ditch in front of you or not? Well, no, I haven't got around to that. Well, why would you expect God to tell you what the next step is for your next, the next season of your life if you haven't dug the ditch right in front of you? And I'm not saying this is a hard dick, a ditch to dig, but it's the one that's in front of us. Almost came out very poorly. So we need to dream big, but start small. If you want to have the spirituality of, say, the Apostle Paul, I'm amazed at people like, I'm going to start having a three-hour time with God every morning. I'm going to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, how long is that going to last? Like, I really love your zeal, but I'm pretty sure that's, that's probably not sustainable. How about we start with 10 minutes? No, that's not long enough. We'll just do that for consistently for a few days and then, you know, realize that God will expand that and your discipline will grow. Or if you have a big dream of, of um, dealing with a broken relationship in your life, it might, it might not happen overnight, but maybe it starts with a conversation or a coffee or, a, or just I'm sorry. Or if you have a kid that's far from God, maybe it starts by praying every day. And a reminder. I'm a huge fan of reminders. Do you guys do reminders? I know people don't tie strings around their fingers anymore. But we have these, these gadgets and gizmos and things. And we have stickies that go on, on refrigerators and things that go on your dashboard. And uh, things that you wear around your bracelets and all this sort of, sort of thing. Get a reminder. No one else needs to know what it means. Let it be a reminder to you every single time you see that you pray. Well, those are small steps that you can do, you can take to do really big things for God. And so it's interesting that uh, it says this is an easy thing in the eyes of the Lord. This is, this is no problem for God because he's a God of miracles. We got this. And timing, just because something's easy for the Lord doesn't mean it's, he's always going to accomplish it tomorrow. Sometimes the Lord has us on a longer experience, a longer journey. He's, there's more for us to learn. There's more things for us to walk out before he really fills the ditch with water. And that's part of God raising us up. Verse 19, as we finish here. Uh, well, 20. Uh, 19 just talks about you're going to be successful in this military endeavor. And the next morning, about the time for the offering of sacrifice, there it was. Water flowing from the direction of Edom, and the land was filled with water. So how do we do this? Really quickly before we end. Just a few ideas for you. These are just my thoughts. Uh, next slide. Um, on how, how we can dig some ditches. The first one is to keep praying. Keep waiting on God. Keep asking God that question. For that daughter of yours that you haven't seen the breakthrough in yet. For that job that you've been praying for. For that relationship that's broken. For the finances that you've been, things that you've been dreaming or planning or, or that are on your heart. For that ministry that, that God, you feel like God is calling you to. Keep praying. Keep digging. Don't stop. You're going to be tempted to stop. Don't stop. Second one, dig deep. Expect God to show up in big ways. I don't know about you, but I always like, God, if it's okay, um, maybe you could just kind of do enough for me so I can get by. God's like, really? I got like the cattle on a thousand hills. And you're like asking for like one small calf. I mean, go big. Ask for a herd. It's okay. It's not presumptuous. It's called faith. As it turns out, that's a really good thing. Third, go back and dig in the last place you know God put an X on the ground. And that's what I was talking about, about going back to that last clear thing you're supposed to obey on. Follow through on that. Sometimes it's something very small that God's called you to. Fourth, don't dig alone. This is not a solo sport. This is not an individual sport. This is a team sport. Um, just like our Holes movie that I was showing a little clip from, where all those kids are out there digging holes together. Um, the same thing is true. Share your situation. Share your struggle. Share your journey with others so they can be praying and digging with you. Fifth, um, dig the first few inches uh, before you get to foot three, four, five, six. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Sometimes we have these grand, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do music on a big stage. But for me, what that meant was doing music 
at a care facility for people that were really old. Nobody knew I was there, but I was being obedient to the Lord. As it turned out, it was an incredible blessing to me. So don't despise the small breakthroughs. And last, thank God in advance for his provision and his answer. I am... I have been a runner in the past, and um, in the most difficult times of running, um, sometimes you just feel like you didn't drink enough, you didn't hydrate enough, you didn't eat enough food the day before, whatever, and you're just not prepared, or you're you're hurting. Um, One of the things I learned in in running, especially long distances over 10 miles, is you just get weary, and you just start asking the Lord to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to thank you for the strength you're giving me right now. Thank you, Lord, for the strength. Thank you, Lord, for the strength. So I'm finishing this half marathon. I'm going up the last .1 miles. I'm 13 miles into this thing, and there's a hill at the end. I'm like, this is cruel. And, and as I'm running up, I'm just, I'm, I feel like I'm about to, like, pass out as I go over the finish line. I'm trying to get this certain time that I felt I wanted to get two hours. I was really working hard to get it. And I realized that I didn't have the strength to make it up the hill. So I just began praying out loud, Lord, thanks for the strength. Thank you, God, for the strength. Thank you for giving me the strength. And I could feel the strength literally just coming up from my feet in my body. By the way, next time you exercise and you're like really struggling, just begin thanking him ahead of time. You'll be absolutely shocked. You'll feel the tingle come up. Why? Because God wants to meet you. He wants to bless you. It's his heart to provide for you. He wants to strengthen you and help you. In every way, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially. He wants you to walk into life to the fullest. Not so you can get rich, but so that he can show you that you're a loved son or a loved daughter and walk with you in that way. Well, as we finish, I want to just mention George Mueller. Um, George Mueller was an amazing man of God. He took care of uh, over 120,000 orphans in his life. Absolute incredible vision. Incredible vision for God. He lived in the 1800s. He died in the late 1800s. He was was an evangelist. He was a pastor. He was there in Bristol. And when I was in Bristol uh, two years ago, I sat at his desk. I just thought, I want to be a father like that. I want to have a heart and a vision for more than just my kids, although having a vision for my kids could change the world. My three kids can change the world. And it's a big vision just to invest in them. But, but God, how much further can you help me see? How many other sons and daughters can I help raise up? How many people can I help to empower to step into their destiny? So I sat at this desk and I said, God, I want this kind of vision. I don't know that I have it yet, but I'm really praying for it. And I believe it's on God's heart. Why? Because this was a man who, one morning, all the, po- the plates, he says in his journal, all the plates and the cups and the bowls are on the table were empty, and there was no food, and there was no money to buy food, and the children were standing waiting for their morning meal. And Mueller said, children, you know that we must be in time for school. And then lifting up his hands in prayer, he said, dear father, we thank you for what you're about to give us to eat. And it was, there was a, then a knock at the door, and the baker stood there and said, Mr. Mueller, I, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt that I, you didn't have bread for breakfast, so the Lord wanted me to send you some, so I got up at 2 a.m., and I baked some, and here it is. Mr. Mueller thanked the baker, and no sooner had he left that there was a second knock on the door, and it was the milkman. He announced that his milk cart had broken down right there in front of the orphanage, and he would have to unload it. And, and, and so he said, can I give it to the children, the, these, for this fresh milk, so I could empty my wagon and fix the wheel? This is the kind of man of faith that he was. He never went into debt. Why? Because he believed that God was going to provide, even if it was the last second. He was a man who knew how to dig a ditch, whether it was for breakfast or for another orphanage house. He had a vision that was big, and yet he realized the first small step was seeking God. If there's anything you get out of this morning, you need to understand that digging all comes down to seeking God. Really asking him to come through. 
Not arranging our life so we don't have to trust him. Not arranging our life so we can somehow have a backup plan. I want to burn the plows and surrender to God. And then after I burn the plows, I want to dig ditches. Because I believe that the more ditches I dig, the more I prepare my own heart, the more I prepare anyone around me to receive what God has, he's going to show up. And I have faith for that. So I want you to stand. And as, as we... Um, as I dismiss you, prayer folks, if you'd come down. I just, uh, I want to I pray and ask the Lord to give you a gift of faith this morning. To dig a new ditch that you haven't dug. To, to come into a place where you believe that God really wants to come through for you. He wants to come through for you in your business, in your work. He wants to come through for you in your school. He wants to come through in your future. When you picture your future, don't picture yourself by your, your, yourself just standing there lonely. Jesus is right with you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He wants you to prepare a place in your heart where he can come and move. So God, I pray for a gift of faith for us. If, if you want to receive just this morning, you can put your hands out like this as a symbol of your open heart. God, we want to receive what you have. So I pray for a gift of faith for my friends in Jesus' name, that we would step into a new place of believing that you, you really do want to do great things in and through us. And Lord, just give us wisdom. We, we ask for your wisdom to understand what the next steps are. Call us and show us where, that, where that, that last command was that we missed, that we just need to, to, to be obedient and press through. Lord, I pray that today would be a day of breakthrough and that there would be new hope birthed in our hearts to step into a new place of receiving from you. God, I believe that you want to take us places that we could never go on our own. And so we submit to you. And we pray in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a prayer need, we'd love to pray for you. Otherwise, we will see you next week.